away, Teddy internship and her Master of Science degree in Nutrition from Bastyr University in Seattle. So we are so excited to have Susan Levin here with us today. Please welcome her. Okay, give me one minute to figure out the uh, microphone. Okay, can you hear me okay in the back? If I move away. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. I really appreciate it. I wasn't sure if this particular topic was a little too DC specific, a little wonky about <laughs> the politics of food and how the government plays a role in your food. Um, but the planners of Northwest Veg Fest assured me there would be some people here that are actually interested in this concept. Um, this is pretty much why the organization. <laughs> with which I work, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is based in Washington, D.C., because it's really our best hope to make any change on the federal side. Having grassroots efforts and activism and advocacy all over the country is really important, but there's definitely a role to be played in D.C. where a lot of the decisions are made that can help everything move forward um, elsewhere. So I'm going to be discussing a few different topics that are related to the, the federal government. Some of them to the dietary guidelines. Are any of you familiar with the dietary guidelines? Sort of, you know what they are? We'll talk about that. My plate, which is actually a separate issue than the dietary guidelines, but you're probably familiar with my plate, which is this icon here. The farm bill, probably hear about it in the news, but you probably are like most people, what the heck is it and why is it so hard to handle? Um, the National School Lunch and Breakfast Programs, uh, and Checkoff Programs. Has anyone here ever heard of Checkoff Programs? Ooh, that's good. Most people don't know what that is, and I find it to be one of the most scandalous parts of um, the USDA. So the dietary guidelines are going to start there. This is essentially a blueprint for all federal food policy that is made going forward. So it, it impacts what's served in school lunches. It impacts what dietitians are telling their patients to consume. Um, it impacts what people eat in any federal food program, prisons, Native American reservations, um, elderly people that receive food from, from in elderly population services. And it is run by, the, the most recent was 2010, of course. It happens every five years. So even though 2015 is the next round, we're already you know, our boots are on the ground already trying to affect change for the 2015 version. So in case you don't know, the dietary guidelines are managed by two different federal agencies, one being the Department of Health and Human Services, and the other being the USDA, and these are both the secretaries still in both of those departments. But if you know what the USDA was created to do, they were created to support uh, agriculture in this country and then somehow later and it made sense at the time they got involved in making nutrition recommendations to people so you immediately have this innate conflict of interest which is to support farmers and also to recommend what we should be eating so it's a little hard for them and I, I, I can empathize with the fact that they have to do both of those things in 1991, when they were um, thinking of, this is, a, this is the, um, the diagram. This, in this picture, you'll see Dr. Campbell, uh, Dr. Burkett, which if you're here from McDougal, we probably talked a little bit about him. Dr. Barnard, who's the head of PCRM where we were, a little younger. And um, this guy is Dr. Alabaster, he was a, a cardiologist at no, an oncologist at George Washington University. They went up to, they made a press conference near the White House in 1991 and said, if you're thinking about changing the diagram that reflects what people should be eating, at the time, does anybody know what, what it was in 1990, number four? It was the four food groups. And they said, four food groups are crazy because they're fruits and vegetables, um, meat, dairy, and grains. And they said that's not a science or evidence-based recommendation, those four food groups. You need to use more science and the four food groups really should be fruits, vegetables, 
grains, and beans. Um, they didn't really expect to get that much attention, but as it happened, a pretty important reporter came to this press conference from the New York Times, and her name is Mary Burroughs. She's not at the Times anymore, but she's still out there doing a lot of food writing. And she said, she wrote this article announcing a group of physicians uh, is asking the Federal Department of Agriculture, the USDA, to abandon the four food groups and to go with uh, a radical new grouping of foods. And the, four, the new four food groups are proposed here as um, what we should be eating. Everything else is optional, including meat and dairy. And lo and behold, a week later, the USDA puts out this diagram that they had been working on, mind you, for a few years. A marketing organization works on it. And it's called the Eating Right Pyramid. And the, the, the meat industry was already a little bit in a tither from this Times article that these physicians got any attention at all for making this proclamation. And then now they see this, and suddenly they are not one of the four food groups, but rather they're put on a hierarchy of far less importance. Um, with grains, fruits, and vegetables being more important, and then suddenly they're in this little tiny category on a pyramid. They did not like this at all. And they made it well known, and Mary Burroughs comes back. The USDA retracted that pyramid pretty quickly, and the, the uh, Mary Burroughs did another article and said, even though this was done, this was going to print, um, it's pretty clear who's actually in charge of making dietary recommendations here. It's uh, the beef industry, because it was the cattlemen's organization that asked the USDA to withdraw that pyramid. Now, for whatever reason, a year later and a million dollars later, they put this out, and somehow this is more acceptable to the Cattlemen's Association. It's just slightly different. Uh, a difference in name and a little bit difference in where they put their recommendations for servings. So, not sure why, but, but it, what, what did become clear is that there's more to making dietary recommendations than just even what the USDA says or the Department of Health. Uh, if the cattlemen didn't like it, it wasn't going to happen. Then, about 10 years later, when they're deciding the 2000 dietary guidelines, um, PCRM did something what's called a fo what we call a FOIA, which is using the Freedom of Information Act, where you can look up public people in public federal field and get some background information on them by law. You're, you're allowed to do that. So we FOIA'd who's on this committee making this decision, because the dietary guidelines are written by a committee of about 12 people. Um, and then that is filtered through uh, the USDA and the Department of Health and, and narrowed down to a much shorter dietary guidelines document. But who's on this committee? And when you look in their background, the majority of them had industry, direct industry ties to meat and dairy. Uh, and egg. So that's not supposed to happen. So we sued the um, USDA and said, you can't have this, you need more transparency, you should retract the dietary guidelines that have been written because there's no way that they're unbiased. Um, we won, which was good. Not much changed with those guidelines, unfortunately, but um, we did find that in the 2005 and in the 2010 and now in the 2000 dietary guidelines advisory committees much more transparent and the industry ties are much fewer however I mean still most researchers and nutrition experts are funded by various drug companies food or food companies um, but in terms of just blatant meat and dairy egg ties not so much anymore so that was something good that did come out of that also the 2010 guidelines you if you're not familiar with it plant-based diets were touted, they were really touted by the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in the 500 page document. And when it got narrowed down to 100 pages once filtered through the USDA, it wasn't quite as clear that plant-based diets were um, what we should be eating. They watered that down a lot, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But in the back, they had a vegan appendix and a vegetarian appendix, how to follow the Dietary Guidelines as a vegan or as a vegetarian. So, the fact that they even used B words was, was progress. So we really feel like we're making progress, although clearly there's, there's more work to do. So it's getting a little bit more transparent. 
But our goal is to have something that really, really reflects science. Now, right now, if I read the 2010 Dietary Guidelines, it says stuff like this. Consume less than 300 milligrams per day of dietary cholesterol. Well, you guys probably know kind of what that means, but the average American walking around the grocery store isn't looking for cholesterol and what has cholesterol and what doesn't. What they probably should say is something more like, eat fewer or no animal products. These are the only sources of dietary cholesterol. Most people don't know that, and unfortunately, they're not being quite that clear when they write these guidelines. Reduce the intake of calories from solid fats. Solid fats is a completely made up term by this committee to avoid saying what they're really trying to say again, which are products like meat and dairy. And they've been called out for this. I've heard Walter Willett from the um, Harvard School of Public Health on radio shows saying, you know what, I don't know what a solid fat is, I'm a pretty smart guy. Um, and then, of course, Marion Burroughs, still very active in this area, stood up at the announcement of the dietary guidelines at a press conference. And she said to Secretary Vilsack, the secretary of the USDA, why don't you just say it? Why don't you just say people need to stop eating meat? It was a really tense and funny moment there. I was sitting there like, I wouldn't even say that. Um, and Bill Sapp was like, oh, we, you know, we're, we kind of say it. We, we, it's implied. And uh, it's like, well, no, yeah, it's implied. But you'd have to be, um, you'd have to know how to use this decoder ring to figure it out. So basically what they're saying is eliminate meat and dairy. These are the biggest contributors of solid fat. And the reason I know they're the biggest contributors of solid fat is because there's a pie chart in the dietary guidelines that lists out the, air, the solid fat sources in the American diet, and meat and dairy are their number ones. But you'd have to be that dedicated to read the guidelines to even know that. So, something else they say. Consume less than 10% of your calories from saturated fatty acids. OK, well, again, most Americans don't even know what saturated fatty acids are, much less than what food sources you find them. So it would be nice. They said skip the cheese, ice cream, and other dairy products. Dairy products are the number one source of saturated fat in the American diet. How do we know that? They have another pie chart in the dietary guidelines. So if you take the time to match up this pie chart to some of the verbiage, you can see that the number one source, literally the number one source is cheese, the number one source is saturated fat. But if you really take the time to look at all the sources, of the dairy products, you can see that by far, most of this pie is made up of dairy products in terms of the saturated fat sources in our diet. And milk is actually the number one source of saturated fat in a, in a child's diet. So it's a long road, but I have to say we're getting there. And when, when you look back to what the guidelines, or at least the icons that they used to present were, um, it's much better. It used to be very, very, very much about eating a lot of um, animal products, cheese and milk. We're kind of getting away from that. They're a little bit schizophrenic and getting all over the place. Sometimes they take a huge step backwards, like they did with my pyramid after um, the Food Guide Pyramid, which was just this uh, indiscriminate striped, striped pyramid that you would have to have internet access to to even understand what it means. It didn't come with any particular explanation. They were ridiculed for this for years until um, they came up with MyPlate. But before they came up with MyPlate, I don't want to brag, but we, this is not Photoshop, we literally took <laughs> a six foot power play, our version, down to the White House and said, you know, Get the press there. This is this should be what you're recommending, not uh, my pyramid. At the time it was my pyramid, and of course, you know we got some press, but um, press showed up, and so did uh, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "That's not me. I'm the I'm the White House. You need to go to the USDA." That's true. We were just trying to get a little attention, so we did. We went down to the USDA and we said, "Here's uh, what we think you should be recommending instead of uh, my pyramid is the power play." And not to be, um, just one of the world. We didn't go to Egypt. I'm just kidding about that. Um, so in 2000, 
2009, this is our power play. We'd already tested it in um, schools and found the, the friendliest version for kids, for adults, to understand what we were trying to convey, which is eat fruits, vegetables, beans, and grains, eat as much as you want, um, it's all you really need. And then, lo and behold, the USDA in 2011, of course, my first call was down to the legal office, like, can we sue them? They clearly stole, like, no, you just paraded it around uh, Washington, D.C. and told them to steal it, so, oh yeah. Great. So, it's progress, it's not perfect, um, but the fact that they took out even the word meat, pretty good and substituted in protein. It's a little random. They're still skipping around things because they're scared. Um, like we know what a fruit, a vegetable, and a grain is, but what is a protein? It's not a food. It's in everything, so um, whatever. They're trying. And then the dairy satellite, of course, just screams, uh, we are paid for by the dairy industry. But that's okay. I think it's still progress, and we still have options like the power plate. We have options, if you've ever seen the Harvard plate, it has water instead of dairy, which is pretty good. And if, you're, if you bother to read any of the terminology associated with my plate, it does say um, beans, is, beans, tofu is a source of protein, and soy milk is as, as your dairy. Not that that's required, but they do say it. So the next mammoth Thing in Washington, D.C., food policy is the farm bill. Uh, this is something nobody likes, um, except for maybe Monsanto and other giant um, agricultural businesses that reap a ton of money off of the farm bill every five years or every year, every day. But um, whenever it comes up, nobody wants to touch it. It's so big, um, it's so nasty, it, it involves everything, including things that we don't necessarily deal with at PCRM, like the antibiotics on factory farms, um, the insurance paid out to these huge corporations. So these are your tax dollars paying billionaires billions of dollars every year. These are not small farmers anymore. One of the big, biggest parts of the farm bill uh, is what's called SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Program, and it um, used to be called food stamps. And this is something we are trying at PCRM trying to, to tackle on, um, when the farm bill comes up and, and throughout. So why, why is it important? Well, it's been, um, it's been around for a long time, obviously. It's one of the largest, it is the largest food assistance program we have. It's for people who are um, low income and at a disadvantage financially for sure, and certainly in terms of health care. Um, the participation is bigger than it's ever been and probably going to grow a little bit more in the, in the next years when they look back. And what can you use with your SNAP benefits? Well, you can buy anything <laughs> legally uh, with the exception of things like tobacco and alcohol, um, non-edible products, so you couldn't buy diapers, um, you can't buy vitamins. And you can't buy food that's already made. So you couldn't, for example, go to a salad bar at the grocery store or buy the, the pre-made deli items. Anything else is up for grabs. Um, and I would argue that SNAP perpetuates food deserts. That if you can use anything with your SNAP benefits, then a grocer is probably going to do the most financially beneficial thing for himself or herself, which is to stock very shelf-stable, cheap foods. And that's exactly what, what they do. So this is a food desert bodega here. And I don't know if you can see that. We accept food stamps proudly. But when you go inside, what are you going to get with your food stamps? You're going to get a bunch of bad stuff. <laughs> um, no, no, no. <laughs> it's being filmed. So, um, yeah, so, so what is the incentive for the grocer to stock something more healthful? Well, there is no incentive. Um, what we propose is something that would, and this is very controversial, and I understand there's two sides to this argument, but we propose a program that supports buying only healthful foods. And we obviously have an opinion about what that means, but there are other examples. 
Um, I don't think by any means that the WIC program is supportive necessarily of very helpful diets, but it's better. It's better than what the SNAP program is doing, and we would say we need something like that. We need something with restrictions so that people are buying healthier foods. So what would, what would that look like? Well, it would be uh, oats with dried fruit, apples, bananas, oranges, uh, vegetables, fresh or frozen, brown rice, lentils, um, more vegetables, pasta, tomato sauce, peaches, you know, so that would be your basic meal, which is pretty good. And we actually calculated out, well, I'll show you this. Um, so what we did was we, we did this. We know that um, what the average SNAP participant spends in a month with, with his or her um, allocated dollars. And we said that we could, we could compare a healthier diet using those SNAP dollars and see, see what we get. So what we did is we showed that with the same amount, actually with less money, you could buy more food, more nutritious food, and have a better profile. So it would be less fat. And this is looking at the, what the average American consumer eats, not necessarily with what a SNAP user uh, eats. But even just with the average American, with our healthy basis plan, it would be 65% less fat than the average American, less saturated fat, much less saturated fat. Zero cholesterol, of course, because we would only support um, plant-based items. More than twice the fiber, iron, vitamin E, and whatever I just went over, folate, which you get from your green leafy vegetables. Um, twice the potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And more vitamin D, um, five times the beta carotene. So we, we did this, we also put it on the Alternative Healthy Eating Index. Do you, are you familiar with this? This is something actually the, what is now the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics came up with the Healthy Eating Index, which is a way of looking at the nutrient profile of what we eat and determining your disease risk from that. Well, because it was created by my professional group, dietitians, it wasn't necessarily all that helpful or progressive, so Harvard came in and said, we'll give you a better one, couldn't call it the alternative one. Um, and it rates the food quality. And when you rated our Healthy Basics program against, again, the average American, what he or she consumes, it gets a much higher rating on this alternative healthy eating index score. So something in the high 60s like this would be very good in terms of preventing chronic diseases uh, and longevity as well. There are also, we're not, PCRM is not backing a cut to SNAP benefits, mind you. What we're saying is there needs to be some restrictions that um, allow people to eat better. People who might not know, most Americans don't, what a healthy diet looks like. And it also um, would, you could buy more. You could buy more food. But we proved that you could do a, a 1,800 calories a day with our healthy basics and it would cost less than what the average person using food stamps spends now per person. So the average person spends about $134 a month on food stamps. We're suggesting this, which provides more calories, more nutrition, less disease risk, more longevity, um, for $121 a month. So the excuse that it would be too expensive doesn't really fly in the face of reality. The political obstacles, there were not, there's no shortage of this. Um, Congress doesn't want to touch, touch SNAP. Nobody likes it, nobody wants to talk about it. Even if behind closed doors they might say, yeah, there needs to be some, some restrictions on what people can buy, you know, do they really need soda and candy? Not so much, you can buy whatever you want. This is supplemental, this is the money that they're getting from um, the government, maybe there should be some restrictions, just like there is with WIC. But the opponents call it paternalistic, which I understand. Like, you can't tell. It's like telling poor people what they can and can't eat. Um, and it, uh, it limits food choices. What, no, no. We say other programs like WIC, like the school lunch program, it limits the food choices that the people who have who are using it have, why is SNAP suddenly, you know, all, no hands can touch what people should be eating. Um, 
corporate influence, there's plenty. Coca-Cola and other food uh, industries like Kellogg, all of them, give big money to Congress and don't want anybody touching SNAP because they make a lot of money off of SNAP users. Anti-hunger groups are also funded oftentimes by these um, big corporations, which creates, I think, a conflict of interest for when they don't want to touch SNAP, no, leave SNAP alone. I have to wonder if maybe some of that isn't coming from pressure from the people that fund those groups. Um, and fast food lobby is pretty big, and they don't want this to happen, because in some states, you can use your SNAP for fast food, and they would like to see more states offering that as well. Now, as of right now, the USDA won't allow you to even experiment with restrictions. Like, um, it's just such a, it's so taboo. They claim it, we can't do it. It's, it's a uh, logistical nightmare. Um, no one's going to understand it. It can't even be done, like trying to change all those barcodes. It's impossible. Um, but we have heard from insiders that um, it is very possible. It's not that hard to do. And it's just, again, like WIC. You just have to know what you can and can't buy. Um, and there are a, co a coalition of supporters for weaker initiatives, so incentive pilots. And we like those, too. And that's kind of like, um, like double your food dollars if you're buying fruits and vegetables kinds of things. And that's great, too. The problem with that is the government doesn't want to double your food dollars. That costs them money. So they tend to shy away from that. But we do see more support for incentive programs, for sure. Um, so there does seem to be a groundswell, I, I probably like in the past year or two, where people were actually talking about restricting SNAP dollars towards certain foods. And this is the first time we've ever seen this with journalists. And a lot of um, healthcare professionals actually are coming out, like Harvard School of Public Health is finally saying we need to we need some restrictions around food, food um, these food dollars. And there's now a bill that's been proposed by a congressman from Tennessee, uh, who is also a physician, who doesn't want to cut SNAP, but he does want to see some restrictions. And he suggests a WIC-like model as well. So it, it is, interestingly, a nonpartisan issue because both groups can see both sides. You kind of have haters and lovers on both sides. So there, there's an opportunity to bridge here. All right. What I'd like to say right now, again, this is like an advertisement. Use your SNAP dollars here. It's in front of the candy counter. But if you couldn't use your SNAP dollars for that, I would argue this is what you would see in food deserts, because those sellers in food deserts want to make money, too. <coughs> So a real quick look into food subsidies. If you um, have any idea what what this means, the government has a lot of contracts with different farmers on what you um, on, on what they sell, did what went to waste, and the government is responsible for picking up the tab on a lot of that. If you do, if they didn't sell enough milk that year, well, the government is obligated to buy up the excess. Um, and this is where those dollars go. Most of them go, of course, to meat and dairy. And that's because most of the grain that's grown in this country is grown to feed cattle and um, animals. So it's not a direct subsidy to meat and dairy. It's, it's through the feed by and large. But um, only 20% of the grains that we consume um, are subsidized. Very, by the way, the fact that there's any subsidy going to fruits and vegetables is only because this year there was some kind of flood or something with apples, so they got a support, but usually it's zero. So um, it was interesting that the President's Cancer Panel actually said, admitted, that we don't subsidize the right foods. We subsidize foods that are known to contribute to obesity and chronic diseases, including cancer. So on the one hand, we're making these recommendations, like consume less saturated fat, solid, solid fat, and cholesterol, but on the other hand, those are the very foods that we're subsidizing. Same organization. And I think this is the prime example of, of this conflict of interest, which is you can harken back to when people thought swine flu um, could be contracted through eating pigs, which it can't, but whatever. Um, it, the consumption of pork dropped tremendously, and that meant the pork farmers were in trouble. And they said to the government, well, you need to buy all this pork that nobody's eating. And so they did. 
and they spent over $50 million buying out the excess pork. Does anybody know where it might have gone? Yeah, into kids. The National School Lunch Program had to figure out how to use more pork that their parents were too scared to eat. It was going to go into your uh, lunch line. Um, now, schools aren't doing so well. If you look at their own, the USDA's own um, audit will show that very few schools even comply. This is unrelated to the pork problem, but they don't even comply with their own standards in terms of fat and saturated fat that's served on a tray. They go way over, and there's really no penalty to that. Um, they're not following their own rules, but there's no, no exact penalty. So again, with the Farm Bill, we were able to get some organizations like the American Medical Association to agree that there needs, in the school lunch program, there needs to be more vegetarian foods and healthful non-dairy beverages. So that was a pretty big um, statement from the AMA to make that. And we tried to get the last round of the Farm Bill, not the one that's currently sitting dormant, but five years ago, to listen to the AMA, and we got pretty close, but it was interestingly, interestingly not the farm states that stopped any progress in the Farm Bill that time, but it was urban, urban representatives who were scared of uh, making angry those little small, um, the food deserts basically, because they felt like they didn't want any change there. Um, and school lunch, of course, is very important because the number of children that go through and eat the school lunch program and are getting this message that this is what we're going to feed you, this is what's healthful, uh, it's wrong. And we see it in the statistics, in the health statistics of kids today. 33% are overweight or obese. About half of those are obese. 20% of teens have an abnormal cholesterol level. And 25% of teens right now have diabetes or prediabetes, which is an incredible statistic. If you know anything about diabetes at all, this is the most costly, one of the most sad in terms of what it does to your body. Um, and the rates are just going up and up and up and up. So my favorite program is the checkoff program, because I just can't believe it exists. It is a mandatory fund for a commodity, commodity product. Um, it's it's used for promotion. It's used to increase demand. Uh, it's very generic. It, you know, what it means is if I wanted to be a dairy farmer, I would have to, no matter how small, I would have to pay a tax into what's called a checkoff. Uh, that by law, I pay this tax to the that goes to the USDA, <coughs> who manages all this money, and they in turn will promote dairy generically, and, and then the idea is I would somehow benefit from that on my small farm. So you see ads like this, um, got milk, right? So it's promoting a product that may support a very small dairy farmer in, in Pennsylvania, um, and they, they in turn pay for these ads, every, every dollar that's contributed to the checkoff. And it's not just milk. Beef, of course, has its own checkoff, and they come up with their own logos and slogans. Pork, the other white meat. I mean, they're very, I have to say, their campaigns are masterful. I mean, they're brilliant. It's like McDonald's. They obviously have a lot of money to pay for some of the best marketers out there. Egg, the incredible edible eggs is what the egg farmers are paying for. <coughs> And I want to talk about, I'm not ending on this just because he's good looking, but I want to talk about this particular Got Milk is an Umbrella checkoff ad that um, has a lot of different offshoots. And one of them is this one, the Body by Milk. Um, Body by Milk. And what this says is um, it, the dairy checkoff in general was created in the early 80s. These ads began in the mid 90s. Um, and we, when we saw these ads, I mean, they're all horrendous, but what we couldn't believe in this one is that it actually says it's going to make you leaner. And we wondered, having spent years reading every medical journal out there, like, where did they get that? We've never seen any science to back that up. So we asked the FTC to stop the ads, the ones that say body by milk, that have the, um, 
the declaration that by drinking milk, um, you'll be leaner. And then they even, I think it's this one, yeah, they drag kids into this. So just teens who choose it tend to be leaner. Where did they get that? And we said to the FTC, we can't find any science to back that up, so you need to um, straighten, straighten that out. And they did, in fact, ask. We won. They asked the uh, checkoff program managers, you can't say this anymore, you got to pull all these ads. They're very good. They finessed it differently, but they, knew, they no longer suggest that um, milk leads to weight loss since there's no science to back that up. But in just in case you think that um, this isn't, I'm not saying, oh, I don't know, were any of you in here for McDougal? He likes to say it's not a conspiracy, it's just business. <laughs> and I think that's right. I mean, I think this is, I don't think these people are trying to kill us per se, but I do think they are making a lot of money off of us being addicted to their foods and getting sick from them. Um, we speculated that, of course, and when you see, when you pull all the documents that we can FOIA, so we can see their conversations between the government and um, places like McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, where they have these very expensive campaigns, where there was one that was built on the whole premise that people who eat chicken don't eat enough cheese in fast food. How can we get people to eat more cheese who are eating chicken? Well, we can put cheese on uh, chicken sandwiches. And so the Chick-fil-A, which doesn't sell burgers, does sell chicken. So they started a whole campaign to have cheese added to their sandwiches, which you know, again, this is the government that just told us we eat too much cheese, we need to stop eating cheese, but let me put all this money into, manage all this money and create these great campaigns to get people to eat more cheese. And if you, this is a PowerPoint presentation that came up in one of our FOIA documents where they are having an actual powwow how to get people more addicted to cheese. And they even use language around addiction terms, like how do we get people to crave it? And then they categorize us as cravers and enhancers and who's gonna be um, our better target? And where are we gonna get more money off the people that are addicted to cheese or the people that are just sort of light users of cheese? Um, so they're not making any bones about it. I mean, this is definitely their mission. So it works, they do things like Wendy's Cheddar Lovers, Subway's Chicken Cordon Bleu, um, the Ultimate Cheese Pizza. These are all checkoff managed programs. These are ideas that come out of the USDA to get people to eat more cheese. And it, it works. I mean, the consumption of dairy products from the early 1900s, even if you start in 1970, uh, it's tripled. Our consumption of cheese from 1970 is tripled per person per year. This says about 31 pounds in 2005, and now I just checked the numbers from 2011, the most recent, and it's over 33 pounds of cheese. So we're still going up. People are still consuming more and more cheese every year, in large part thanks to the USDA, who would also like us to stop eating cheese. <laughs> so um, we're forging ahead. We're still working on all of these programs. We currently are, again, like I mentioned, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2015 is already in full effect. The committee is meeting. Um, they meet for the next couple of years, and you can submit public comments on their website, dietaryguidelines.gov, and give your opinion. If they say they read them, and they say that they consider them. I mean, I wouldn't post anything very angry or ugly, but something thoughtful. Uh, like, have you seen the research that shows this or that or the other? And we encourage people to do that, and we're also going to be there to give oral testimony. There's one morning during this two-year um, meeting of the committee that they allow people to come in and actually give oral testimony, three minutes, to say what you think that needs to be focused on in the dietary guidelines. So we're going to do that, too. Uh, it's too late to register for that, but you can also... Um, Listen online to that. It's very interesting. Last time I did it, I sat between pork and beef lobby. Um, very scary, intimidating. But everybody's there. Dairy, egg, pork, beef, uh, chewing gum. Everyone who thinks that the dietary guidelines should reflect what they believe, um, they're there. So it's super interesting. Uh, but I'm able to do some Q&A and try and ask answer some questions. I think it's just, yeah, you just have to project. Yeah, great. Right. You?
interested or dietary choice is actually making with that subsidy in place? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. I mean, you know, meat consumption is down uh, in recent years, which I think reflects that so some people could argue it's a financial reason because the economy's not so good and there's probably something to that. But I really do believe that this consciousness is getting bigger and bigger and people are consuming less meat. So I do think it matters and I think it's, a, I think it's infectious. I think that I can't believe, I've only been a dietitian for, I've been vegan for almost 20 years and a dietitian for almost 10 years. And just, and, and I know there's, you know, to hear Dr. Varner or Dougal talk about what was going on 40 years ago, and they can't believe it. But even in just my little small window, the change that I've seen in the numbers of people, I think it makes a big difference. And I think it's important to maintain that. Now, in terms of money and subsidies, um, I do think the USDA is becoming, people are shaming them more in a way. And eventually, the farm bill is going to have to, to reflect people's dissatisfaction with subsidizing corporations, basically, um, on both sides of the aisle. You know, very conservative people don't like it for obvious reasons, and the liberal people don't like it because they're just a little bit more progressive about health. Um, and with Obamacare coming up and the focus on prevention, um, it, it's only going to become. There's going to be a brighter light on all of this too, nutrition and health. I think. I see what you're saying. Um, I think, I do think that no, the numbers probably are adjusted for that. I don't think they're just killing animals that they know are not going to be consumed or bought in any, any way. I don't, I think that um, a farmer can get money without actually producing product. So it's not like, you know, as long as the contract's in place, I would be surprised if a farmer, for financial reasons, would go through the trouble of producing a product that they could get paid for anyway without even producing it. Does that make sense? That's what I suspect would happen as demand goes down. They might, I mean, it's still all crazy. The farm goes crazy. And I'm sure they're getting money, but I'm not sure they're producing as much product. Uh, you said about the food plate, uh, the USDA is dancing around and they're scared. What are they scared of? Is it budget cuts? Well, they just, they don't want to tell people what not to eat. They don't like <laughs> to use food when they say what not to eat. Um, whereas they're happy to use food when they tell you what to eat. So eat lots of fruits, eat dark leafy greens, eat um, orange fruits and vegetables. But when they say don't do something, they, they skirt around it. They use nu nutrient phrases that are confusing to dietitians. And I think that's, right now, I think that's their biggest problem. They're so scared to say meat, or even red meat is bad for you. Process, which every, you know, every scientist would tell you is linked to cancer. They won't even, they're just too scared to say it. That um, website again, the dietary guidelines Gov, G-O-V. feels like a drop of water in the ocean, but calling your representatives, and it, you have to kind of be aware of what's going on on the Hill. But if you are, and if you're, if you sign, if you're a member of PCRM or any other activist organization, we tend to let people know, now's a good time to call your local congressperson because the farm bill is being up, you know, there's a vote in on the farm bill or any bill, school lunch, whatever. If you call your representative and say, I want you to support this, or I don't want you to support this, that has a huge impact. They love, well, they really hear, your representatives hear your voice when you uh, have an opinion. They don't care what PCRM has to say. 
unless it could potentially get them out of office, and that's that's the local that's the local voice. And then there's other things you can do um, super locally, like if you have a kid and you can't stand the school lunch, you could go in and have your voice heard that way. I mean, we work with parents in schools, but again, they want to hear from the parent. They don't really want to hear from us, um, but we're there to provide support. Meaning, if they say um, we don't have any recipes that could support, well, we have recipes, so we'll like we'll, that are that are approved and have you know follow all the guidelines of the National School Lunch Program. So we're there to provide that, but, but that would be something you could do locally for sure. Um, submitting public comments to the dietary guidelines as a nurse would be amazing. Um, so yeah, it's 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 it seems probably small, but it's really quite effective, way more effective than what we can do. I mean, we are all about all the information being provided so people can make an educated choice regardless uh, of what it is, organic, GMO. Um, we don't take a big stance on it, just there's not enough, we're such an evidence-based organization and there's not a lot of research on GMOs, um, so we just sort of, we advocate and support any legislation that would make GMOs, uh, the information around GMOs, uh, more available to people. Um, I'm a third grade teacher, and I struggle each year when I talk to my kids about nutrition, because you know we have the we play with the dairy, and the kids will start talking about calcium and all that. And I want to give them the facts, but I don't want a garage of angry parents coming to me, you know, wondering why their kid will no longer drink milk. Right. So I was wondering if you had suggestions on how I might be able to inform them and give them the, the truth without creating, you know, a huge problem with, you know, ideology? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm sure other people might have an opinion. I would probably, personally, I would just the idea that a kid might know that there's calcium in anything but milk seems like progress. So having that in the lineup, you know, and first in the lineup, leafy green vegetables have the most absorbable form of calcium. Um, soy milk, has just as much, if not more, calcium in rich soy milk and the other vitamins and minerals that, that dairy cow's milk has. Um, so I, I, mean, I, I feel like, maybe I'm conservative, but I feel like that would be progress <laughs> if a kid walked out of the class knowing there's calcium in kale or there's calcium in beans. Um, at least they would have that information. I don't, maybe, maybe they're too, uh, maybe that's too conservative, but that would probably be my approach. There's maybe not enough education about healthy eating, and I was wondering, are there any sort of the connections to staff as opposed to really what we can by offering maybe free nutrition classes to people have a better understanding of what they should be buying that would be better? Yeah, and there actually are programs for SNAP users that are that have an educational component to them. Um, they're not necessarily well utilized. And and again, I think it could, that's why I think the WIC model is pretty nice because WIC does come with an educational component and a one-on-one -on -one with a dietitian, which I think is pretty nice. Um, I think there's some concern that people would be interested in it or stick around for it. But then I've talked to other people that say people who are waiting uh, to get their SNAP benefits or to sign up to qualify are sitting in a waiting room for Hours. That would be a great opportunity to educate people about health and diet. So, yeah, that's definitely been something also on our radar. Anyone else? Yeah. So, are almond milk and soy milk good alternatives? Where is it found up? And then, is soy milk I've heard is also could be bad for males to drink a lot of soy milk? Um, I mean, almond and soy milk are good alternatives if, if, if you're just talking about personal preference and there's a lot more out there like hemp and oat and rice. Um, soy milk probably has the closest profile 
to cow's milk because it has more protein than something like almond milk or rice milk. Not that we're having a protein shortage, and I'm going to start that conversation, but if someone's concerned, um, you can say that. And there's no, there's no evidence that soy is harmful to anyone on any level, and certainly not in terms of, did you say for men? Um, no, there's no evidence to support that. I mean, I always recommend people consume more whole soy foods instead of soy, like super processed soy isolates and things that aren't really soy bean anymore. But even then, there's still no evidence that that is harmful. And it's, it, there's only benefits with it, truly, especially for cancer risk. Yeah? Uh, I think what he's referring to is uh, that single study that showed that there could be a correlation between estrogen-like effects and soy protein isolate mm. consumption. Is this the one where like, <coughs> yeah. I feel like there was one study where they fed men an incredible amount of soy protein isolates that was just off the charts crazy. But even then, you know, we don't even, I mean it's, we don't even know that it was actually harmful per se, but I would argue any extract from any food, even if it was broccoli, in excess would probably do something weird to your body. So it's best to just kind of keep everything as close to whole as possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in this forum, as of yet, I have not heard anything about corn or corn syrup. It seems like uh, everything that you can buy on the shelves in the store is inundated with just tons of corn syrup, corn syrup, corn syrup, corn syrup, in different forms. It's just mm -hmm. inundated. Uh, what, what, what is your take on corn syrup? Well, it is one of those subsidized grains, corn. So people are yeah. paid to grow it, and um, that makes it cheap. So it's just cheaper than sugar. So that you're just going to see it. Probably but the health effects is what I was getting at. Isn't uh, that as bad or worse than the uh, excessive sugar that we're inundated with? Um, I haven't. I have not seen any research to show corn syrup is necessarily worse. Human research is worse than um, sugar. I, I I have a personal preference not to consume or recommend people eat something that is that processed. But in terms of how your body reacts to it, um, it's it's just sugar, you know. Well, sugar, sugar. Right, like it, it jacks up your um, glucose levels, and that has all sorts of effects. Yeah. But sh whether it's sugar or high fructose corn syrup <clears throat> seems to have the same effect in, yeah. in terms of human-based studies. And it's hard to get away from it on the shelves, and it's and it has been subsidized by the government forever. For yeah. Anything. Which is why it's just going to always be there <coughs> until they stop doing that because it is so cheap. Yeah. About uh, high fructose corn syrup, I would suggest you read uh, what Dr. Robert Lustig uh, teaches pediatrics at UC San Francisco uh, has to say about them. He's very critical. He even he goes into the chemistry. Mm -hmm. that occurs in your body from the use of them. It's, uh, it's basically an industrial product. Mm -hmm. It's not a natural occurring food, and your body reacts accordingly. Even your body doesn't recognize all of it as being sugar. <coughs> uh, he, his research shows that Something like 30% of your high fructose intake goes directly to fat. It's just how the body is trying to sort out this thing that it's never seen before. Because mm -hmm. it was invented in 1975. And before that, it didn't exist. So the body just sort of like looks at, well, what is this? Right. Well, it decides. Yeah. Some goes here, some goes there. So I think you're referring to Dr. Ludwig? 
Lustig. Lustig? Lustig. Yes. Lustig. A U-S-T-I-G. Okay. He did the sugar as a toxin. YouTube, it was a big on YouTube thing. Okay. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm sure I haven't even seen any like big human studies with it, but that would be interesting to look, look into. And if it is an issue for you, I again I encourage because it is a subsidized food and it is related to the farm bill. Um, it could be something that you, uh, if you're passionate about it, you know, that's something you can call your Congress people about, and that's something you can put public, public comments into the dietary guidelines. Maybe they should be highlighting high fructose corn syrup versus sugar. Um, I guarantee you the high fructose corn syrup people will be at the oral testimony for the dietary <laughs> guidelines. Yeah. I guarantee it. Any other questions? 